Can you see now? Yes, we okay. can hear you um, as well. Um, so we are going to have the next talk by uh, Jeng Lu Li from um, the University of Southern California, uh, USC, and is the final talk of the entire workshop. So let me give you first the opportunity to thank the organizer on the, and all of you to be uh, to have been participating to this great event. And he's going to conclude the talk with some advanced feature, in particular, uh, electron phonon coupling uh, from theory to par practical application. So whenever you're ready, Jeng Lu, please take it on. Thank you, Mauro. And uh, uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, make an announcement for the picture. Um, so uh, right after this lecture, uh, we would like to have everyone move to the Zoom meeting um, so that we can turn on our cameras. So right after uh, this lecture, uh, uh, we will have everyone move to the Zoom. We take the we take the break. The tutorial. So then, um, thank you, Mauro, for the introduction, and thank, uh, thank the whole organizing team for this uh, opportunity um, for for me to talk about this uh, two-dial perturbation theory, uh, particularly for electron phonon coupling. Um, so we've heard about uh, electron phonon coupling. Uh, uh, mainly using DFPT in the first three days. And we've heard about um, GW calculations yesterday and from, also from Jack's talk this morning. Um, so this is about uh, how do we, uh, can we, and how do we make GW correction to the electron phonon matrix elements? Um, so this talk is, is on this topic. Um, I guess um, we've already know a lot of electron phonon coupling, so there are uh, quite important for uh, many phenomena. Uh, and uh, one of uh, the important uh, 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 topic related to like phonon coupling is the phonon mediated or uh, in general, barton cooper schrieffer theory for superconductivity. And here I just uh, put a picture just showing that uh, uh, the superconductivity is also one of the uh, main topic in uh, condensed matter physics and material physics. And we will also cover some of those materials in, uh, in this uh, lecture today. So uh, in general, uh, for ab initio or first principle calculation, one of our uh, main goal is to have the predicted power uh, from uh, computations only. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, modeling or formulating electron phonon coupling from first principles, uh, this is similar to uh, the introductions in the first few days. Um, so we need to introduce the concept of uh, electron phonon matrix elements, which represent uh, the uh, scattering amplitude uh, of one, elect one incoming electron uh, being scattered by a phonon, then uh, scattered to another state. And uh, in general, these uh, scattering are uh, off diagonal, meaning that uh, you start with one state, you can be uh, scattered by different phonons to different um, uh, band states. Uh, with different phonon modes. So in this sense, we can define electron phonon matrix elements uh, where uh, the, this is the typical G, M, N, U, K, Q, huge matrix that you've seen already. And you have initial and final states where uh, they are being connected by the uh, phonon perturbed potential or uh, effective potential seen by the quasi-particle states in, in the material. So um, compared with CFT and GW, uh, we covered yesterday and today that there are some difference here and they are, aim, uh, they are designed for different purpose, purposes. So for DFT, it's a ground state theory and uh, 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 we are solving Cosham equation. And in a Cosham equation, uh, the, the so-called quasi-particle or a single electron state uh, comes from uh, uh, kind of mimicking the self-energy effect as a uh, kind of mean field-like exchange correlation potential. And this potential uh, in general is local and in static DFT is static. Uh, and this is actually not a true effective potential seen by the cause particle. Uh, whereas on the other hand, from the many-body perturbation theory framework, uh, we can uh, uh, directly uh, formulate the excited states of quasi-particles and GW is one of the approximation to the self-energy that include the uh, many electron effects. Um, so uh, uh, in principle, there are many other terms, but we truncate to the first term so that um, uh, sigma is approximately written as uh, IGW. And uh, we noticed that 
in this approximation, uh, the non-local and frequency dependent uh, properties of self energies are all captured within this approximation. So here G is the Green's function and W is the screen coupling interaction. Um, uh, as we have also seen yesterday, um, GW has been very useful in, and developed a lot in the last uh, several decades. Uh, one of the main uh, uh, main highlight is that it provides the correct or closer to experiments, uh, quasi-particle band structures, including band width and band gaps here. So this is a plot uh, showing uh, 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 different materials that uh, the vertical axis is a theory band gap and the horizontal axis is experimental band gap. So if a theory gives exactly the same number of experiment, then uh, the predicted number should lie on this diagonal line. And we see that um, uh, GW band gap uh, agree pretty well with uh, many experiments, whereas if we directly read the Cauchy uh, eigenvalues as band, gap, as band gaps, then uh, we see consistent underestimation here. So this is an indication that uh, the Cauchy uh, uh, exchange correlation potential is not the true uh, effective potential seen by the quasi-particle. And on the other hand, uh, we've also seen and practiced the BSE part, uh, especially when uh, in, 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 in this framework, the BSE uh, 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 kernel interaction is based on the uh, uh, functional derivative of self-energy to the Green's function, where the self-energy is also approximated as a, a GW approximation, so-called GW BSE. So in this uh, uh, way, we can actually get very good agreement on the optical properties uh, for as well as exon properties of materials. So here's another example you've seen already. Uh, that the black dots are the epsilon 2 of silicon uh, and the red curve is what you get from GWBSE. So you, 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 if you finished the second example yesterday, you should uh, have already uh, arrived at this, uh, uh, this result. So uh, with this um, uh, uh, examples and many other uh, examples in the literature, uh, nowadays we can say that the first principles GW and GWBSE methods uh, already becoming the standard ab initial quasi-particle properties and optical excitation methodologies. And uh, 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 so within, I mean, among these two approach, you see the core is actually that we use the GW approximation to uh, approximate self-energy as well as uh, its uh, functional derivative. So um, in this talk, uh, I would like to talk about a new development that we extend uh, the uh, uh, GW self-energy approximation to another uh, 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 topic, which is closely relevant to the topic of this school, that is electron phonon coupling. So uh, as electron phonon coupling, uh, the true description should be uh, the quasi-particle uh, phonon coupling. So we would like to see how the true effective potential, which is a self-energy, responds to the, uh, say, the ionic uh, perturbations in material. So then we developed this uh, GW perturbation theory. And uh, this is a linear response uh, theory, just like density functional perturbation theory. But the core uh, quantity here uh, we are capturing is this uh, derivative of uh, sigma self energy, which is uh, also approximated as GW. Uh, it's derivative to the ion position or phonon modes. So then we can actually use this approach to construct all the needed electron phonon matrix elements, uh, G, M, and U, K, Q, at the GW level. And uh, these matrix elements, just as the DFT matrix elements, they are the building blocks for all the uh, electron phonon uh, properties or theories that you can construct as you practice in the first three days, that many different properties, uh, at least on the electron phonon part, they're all based on the electron phonon matrix elements. So uh, to construct the GW um, uh, self, uh, sorry, GW electron phonon matrix elements is kind of how we construct the um, uh, eigenvalue in a practical way within the GW calculation. Um, we do that uh, in the following: we first take the DFT value and we subtract the um, uh, exchange correlation contribution to the matrix element. Then we explicitly compute the uh, sigma contribution or changing sigma contribution to the matrix element, then we add it here. So then we get the uh, GW 
uh, electron form the matrix elements. So this approach uh, now enables us to have access to systematic, efficient, and accurate electron form con uh, contribution. Especially, uh, uh, I would like to emphasize that this is a linear response uh, theory, so all the calculation uh, can be done within a single unit cell. So um, since this is a school, I, I think I can go a little bit more into uh, the actual implementation or uh, details of the theory a little bit more uh, to, to give you an impression of how this theory uh, was constructed. Um, so I'll talk about it later, uh, but uh, current implementation, we are interfacing with Abinet for the DFPT part. So it's just like um, doing GW calculation, we need to use DFT as a starting point. Doing GWPT calculation, we need to use uh, DFPT as a starting point. So, um, so the DFPT, DFPT part is done in Abinet, uh, which Abinet takes a convention. Uh, when, when you solve DFPT to start, you are not in a phono mode basis because you don't know the phono vectors yet. So you need to choose a basis. So in Abinet, they are taking the lattice vector basis, which means that all uh, atoms within a unit cell can move along A, B, and C lattice vectors. So it's just a different coordinate. So uh, with the, within a linear response, we can actually write the uh, each Q mode. Uh, we can write the differential operator uh, uh, labeled by each Q mode. And um, so to construct the GWPT quantities or the change in the self energy, we need a first order change in the wave function, which is uh, uh, not necessarily readily available in DFPT, but can be constructed from DFPT outputs. And uh, this is just a standard first order perturbation theory. And uh, uh, here I highlight uh, two quantities in the green color. And to emphasize that those are gauge related or they take the same uh, gauge uh, 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 in the calculation. Uh, and especially it's important that we fix everything to the gauge of the initial set of wave function uh, psi in k here. So uh, with this first order change in the wave function, we can construct the first order change in the Green's function. Uh, it's just also within the first order linear response theory. And also these quantities are all gauge consistent to, to guarantee that G itself is the operator and the phase we carry here is just in the E to the IQR, the uh, block phase here. So uh, with the first order change uh, in Green's function defined, we can then construct the um, first order change in the uh, uh, sigma self energy within the GW approximation. And it's being written as DG times W. And uh, you may wonder that uh, in principle, there's another term G times DW term uh, in uh, first order perturbation theory. And we're neglecting that term because uh, this is taken as a constant screening approximation post proposed by uh, Faber et al. And uh, uh, it's a pretty good approximation as they tested and then we tested. And also I would like to uh, emphasize this approximation is equivalent to the well-justified approximation uh, DW over DG in the BSC formulation that uh, actually we discussed yesterday. And um, within the uh, with the construction of uh, uh, delta sigma in the first order, we can then compute their matrix elements. So we can get the uh, sigma contribution part and add it back to, to get the GW level of electron form matrix elements. So these are the main framework of uh, 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 behind the theory, uh, behind the, the method. So, um, so now let's take a look at uh, what we can do with uh, GWPT. So uh, as Professor Justino and Professor Louis talked about in their lectures that the self energy can contain different, many different terms and uh, we can focus on electron electron and electron phono self energy. So uh, for the electron uh, uh, self energy, we were discussing GW approximation uh, if we neglect the vertex correction. And for the um, um, uh, uh, phonon self and uh, electron phonon uh, self energy, we have the fine Migdal and the by Waller term that we also talked about. So particularly with uh, um, GW and GWPT, or uh, in another sense with EPW plus Berkey GW, what we can do is we can uh, change these quantity, the description of this quantity 
from DFT to move to full GW level. Um, so there are several important ingredients. I'm taking this uh, Fanmigdal self energy as an example, uh, uh, and also we neglect the vertex question. So first uh, uh, thing is we can change this grains function G to the uh, 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 interacting grains function from GW. So now we can. Uh, so this is a. Uh, if you do it, you're just uh, replacing the DFT eigenvalue by GW eigenvalues, and also. Now, with the help of GWPT, we can also change this uh, electron phono vertex or electron phono matrix element uh, from DFT to GW. Uh, and on the other hand, for the phonon propagator D, we typically still take its DFPT uh, value because uh, this phonon frequencies in the adiabatic approximation uh, is related to the total energy of the system, which is actually a ground state property. And for ground state property, DFT or its linear response, DFPT, can do a pretty good job. So here, uh, for now, we're still keeping uh, this uh, uh, phone number the DFT. Okay. So um, now um, uh, I would like to spend a little bit more time on this uh, workflow. So uh, we developed this uh, GWPT approach, but it actually takes a lot of efforts, uh, not only uh, for implementing GLPT, but also enabling it to be useful for actual electron uh, calculations. And this is the, uh, uh, the uh, this is the doable uh, thanks to the powerful EPW code. Um, however, on the other hand, EPW is um, in its initial development stage, it's uh, shipped with Quant Espresso. Uh, so we need to make a few changes to uh, in order to have EPW to be able to uh, uh, work with Abinet and virtual GW, or in general, uh, any other input. So here we developed this uh, whole workflow that uh, enables this. And to go through this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to go through this workflow, which is designed for doing a GW level electron phonon coupling from the beginning to the end, this is what we do. So here we start. We start with uh, DFT calculations where we construct the needed quantities like the eigenvalues, wave functions, exchange correlation potential and density, and so on. Then uh, we can do DFPT calculation to get the DFT level metric segments and first order change in wave function and so on. So these are uh, pretty standard, um, just like what Quant, Quant Espresso DFPT can do. And uh, there's a side uh, uh, task that we need to do a vanarization step uh, outside this, this whole loop uh, as a, step, a standalone step. So within, uh, with the DFT quantities, we just do, um, um, actually, as you practiced, we can do uh, both uh, the uh, epsilon calculation or the sigma calculation for GW part. So we construct the inverse dielectric matrix and we can do the uh, uh, GW approximation to evaluate the GW eigenvalues. So this, these are standard that uh, you already practice already. So for the DFP, for the GWPT part, uh, we also need the inverse dielectric matrix, but also we need all these uh, first order change quantities. And then we can construct the uh, uh, delta sigma and, or D sigma then con to construct the uh, GW uh, electron phone metric segments. So uh, after that, we will do a wrapper step um, to wrap everything together uh, to uh, for into the format of EPW. Then we change the EPW code to read this uh, uh, input file. And here we also take a symmetry unfolding uh, 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 process that uh, I'll talk about in the next slide. So once we prepare everything for EPW, now EPW can read in the quantities both at the GW level or uh, uh, at the uh, DFT level or at the GW level. So then we can proceed with the electron phonon calculations uh, either at the DFT level or at the GW level or mix some of those to just figure out some um, insights. And of course, a lot of properties can be computed uh, uh, as long as EPW ha has implemented those. So um, this is the workflow. Uh, here, I would like to mention that uh, 
you you see the quantities. So gauge is the important thing. And you see the quantities are in the green boxes. They are all gauge consistent. And they have to be fixed to the, this initial set of Green's function from DFT. And this is very important. Otherwise, the result will be wrong. Um, so there are two reasons for this gauge consistencies. One is to construct the self-energy operators that I just talked about. And another is because of the requirement of vanarization. So uh, this is because vanarization in this, in this rotation step, the uh, rotation matrix elements or, or rotation matrix or transformation matrix, uh, its gauge, part, part of its gauge is fixed to this set of wave functions. So if we want to do uh, vanarization in the very last step in EPW, we need to make sure all the matrix elements are consistent with this U matrix, as a, which means it's consistent with this psi and K in the beginning. So that's the reason why. And um, so it's not that hard to fulfill this uh, requirement unless you are talking about symmetry unfolding. So because the calculation I will show later are very expensive, so we developed the symmetry unfolding scheme. Um, but this scheme in general, symmetry unfolding will introduce different gauges in the that in the, in, for the same K point basically, and that is what not what we want. So here we uh, developed a, a, a symmetry unfolding scheme with gauge recovering, which means that the gauge will be recovered to the initial state or the ideal state that we require to, to have. And uh, this allows us to reduce the calculation, uh, especially for the GWPT part significantly. And I would like to mention that uh, uh, there's a similar treatment in the latest uh, EPW code, uh, which is uh, briefly described in this archive paper. So let me explain why we will need this um, gauge thing, uh, recovery thing. So here we are reducing the calculation in the Q mesh, which means that we can, we don't need to compute the full Q grid, but we can only uh, we only need to compute the irreducible Q points for the on the course grid from GWPT. So when we have a Q in the reducible wedge, uh, we take a very simple case with, that we only consider uh, rotation, and we can rotate it and unfold this Q to a different Q point as SQ. So all the other quantities like wave functions and so on need to follow the same symmetry operation. And for the wave function or for the electron uh, brain zone, we always uh, use the full brain zone for simplicity. So let's assume we have two K points, K and K prime, and we apply the same rotation. We'll see that uh, this K point would become SK point. And this SK point uh, is equivalent to the K prime point. And here you notice that uh, I put arrows on different K points and the arrows are just to represent schematically a gauge, which is random from diagonalizing your DFT Hamiltonian, um, but uh, put it as an arrow just to, to show that it can pick any number. And But once this number is decided, it takes its number forever. So when we apply the rotation, you note that uh, the gauge at the rotated wave function SK is different from that of the K prime point. Whereas we only want a matrix segment defined in the gauge of this brain zone or of the original gauge. So what we do is that we take the overlap of the two set of wave functions and figure out the gauge uh, difference and apply it to rotate it back. And in practice, uh, and uh, its full formalism is, uh, 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 is summarized here that for any symmetry rotation with rotation and fractional translation, we can apply it to wave functions as well as the electron quantum matrix elements. So for the periodic part of the wave function, it takes a, a relation like this. And uh, in our code, we compute the gauge difference at the rotated wave function and the original wave function. And we denote this uh, full overlap matrix as a D. And then we apply this rotation to uh, to the rotated matrix element in order to have the gauge fixed. So with that, actually, this completes uh, all the workflow that I discussed uh, uh, in, in the previous slide. Then now we can proceed to the uh, full calculation uh, using GWPT. So first, I would like to um, give a brief example. Um, this is a 
uh, actually in relatively simple example on uh, boron dot uh, uh, diamond. Simple means that there are only two atoms in the unit cell. So this uh, boron doped, which is a little bit of whole doped of uh, in diamond, uh, is a superconductor with a TC around uh, two to four um, Kelvin uh, uh, that's discovered in uh, 2004. And uh, this actually has been studied by uh, many people and including one of the earliest work by Professor Justino and Professor Louis. Um, so uh, in this calculation, and I believe that, I think uh, this is the first uh, uh, work uh, on the uh, vernalization of electron phonon coupling matrix diamonds. Um, so in this work, the authors find that uh, the boron dopant phonon modes are critical and um, they can enhance the electron phonon coupling by quite a bit. So uh, this is the uh, 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 unfolded in uh, virtual crystal uh, phonon uh, spectrum uh, for this boron doped uh, diamond case. So if the calculation, uh, they did both virtual crystal and supercell, uh, explicit supercell with boron dopants. So for virtual crystal, one get an uh, lambda around 0.3, and for uh, supercell, the uh, uh, supercell, uh, the lambda is further enhanced to 0.33. And uh, we take this example, uh, not necessarily to discuss much physics, but just to demonstrate the previous workflow and show uh, what we can get. So, um, so now we do this calculation using this Abinet EPW workflow. And this is a uh, DFT versus GW band structure. We see that here the GW uh, uh, increases a little bit the uh, bandwidth, uh, but for the states or dispersion near the Fermi energy, there's not much change in this application. And we can also compute uh, alpha square F, the Lashberg function uh, at both DFT and GW level. So here DFT truly means DFT plus DFPT and GW means GW plus GWPT. So uh, both the eigenvalues and the electron phonon matrix elements are computed at the corresponding level. And we see an uh, uh, enhancement in the coupling strength from the correlation effect as well, uh, besides the uh, disorder effect uh, discovered in uh, previous work. So, um, we are just doing a virtual crystal just to demonstrate we, we, we don't involve supercell. We just want to demonstrate the workflow. So uh, within this virtual crystal approximation, we find the lambda of uh, 2.3, which is close to what uh, uh, Professor Justino discovered uh, uh, 15 years ago. And uh, at the GW level, we find that the correlation uh, effect is enhanced uh, uh, to 0.3. And there's around 30% enhancement uh, and then we can compute TC uh, at different uh, new star value. And because um, the lambda is relatively small, so the TCs are uh, very uh, sensitive to, to the choice of new star. And this is uh, within the uh, uh, eliasberg allendines formula. So we see that the DFPT or DFT level gives us from 0 point, uh, uh, 0 0.01 degree to 0.6 degree, whereas the GW level that gives us a TC around uh, 0.7 to 4 degree. So we do see that the, the GW self energy uh, effects uh, enhance the electron form coupling. And also, uh, I would like to emphasize because the states here do not change much. Actually, this enhancement is mostly coming from the renormalization effects in the electron phonon matrix segments. And of course, if we further include the disorder effect, that uh, presumably should further enhance the uh, lambda. So, uh, with this example, I would like to also show the uh, computational uh, efforts or resources needed in general for uh, GWPT uh, calculation. Um, so they're actually pretty expensive, uh, especially you notice that this is just a two atom cell calculation. So all the calculations are done within this two atom unit cell. So here is a comparison of different steps uh, uh, on the computational cost uh, uh, in terms of uh, in the unit of CPU core hours. And they are running on Frontera attack, which is the machine that uh, we have been using in the system. 
So, uh, so first of all, you notice that DFT can take 10 core hours. This is because this DFT part includes the generation of a function with many bands and also at the full kill grid without symmetry. So that's why it takes a little bit longer than I expected. But plotting on a log scale, we see huge differences uh, 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 between different steps. And we see that um, the DFPT and GW parts actually are similar. Uh, in terms of computational costs, uh, but they are one to two orders of magnitude uh, more expensive than DFT. I think we have already felt, uh, felt these three parts uh, in the practices. But for the GWPT part, uh, we see it's actually over two orders of magnitude uh, more expensive than the GW calculation. And this is because um, there are many phonon modes involved, whereas the number of phonon modes is, uh, 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 is three times number of atoms times number of Q points that you, uh, you calculated. So this can be uh, somewhere between 100 to 1,000 even. And also uh, in GWPT part, we compute all the off-diagonal metric segments, whereas within standard GW, we typically only need the diagonal metric segment. So that's why that gives us another big factor in front of the calculation uh, cost. Okay, so uh, this pretty much demonstrated the workflow already. And uh, I'd like to give a validation set that we did uh, in the past, uh, and also Professor Louis uh, uh, discussed it too. That with a SP. Uh, D band elemental compound oxide metals and look at the electron phonon coupling constant lambda. And uh, uh, the experimental lambda is extracted from uh, terminal experiments, all extracted from terminal experiments. And we see for materials that we conceive to be uh, uh, less correlated, indeed, there is not much, uh, uh, no very big difference between DFT or GW level. But for this oxide, BKBO or potassium doped barium bismuth oxide, uh, we see a large difference between DFPT and GWPT, uh, whereas GWPT results agree nicely with the experiment. So let's take a look what's really going on in this uh, BKBO material. Um, this material is a superconductor with a TC of 32 Kelvin at its optimal doping, uh, whole doping at x equal to 0.4. And it has a simple cubic structure, uh, one band uh, across the uh, uh, Fermi level, which is actually pretty good quality, uh, quality in terms of uh, uh, first principles calculation. So uh, as I mentioned, GLPT is a uh, linear response approach. So we can access all the uh, electron phonon metric segments within the brewing zone and for all phonon modes actually. So here we take a cut in this huge matrix and we can see the distribution of matrix elements, uh, absolute value of G, both at the DFPT and GWPT level. And we see that the GWPT uh, electron phonon matrix elements are larger, uh, actually uh, much larger than the DFPT ones. And we see a strong renormalization in G. And also another thing is that we see the non-uniform distribution, which is actually pretty uh, commonly seen in materials. So that uh, highlights the need uh, for uh, this uh, linear response access to the different part of the brain zone. So uh, taking all the matrix elements at the DFPT and GLPT level, we can compute lambda uh, in this material. And uh, within DFPT level, it's around 0.5, less than 0.5, but at the GWPT level, it's larger than 1.1. Uh, so we see a factor of 2.4 enhancement in uh, the coupling constant. And also experimental extract, extracted value is around 1.2 to 1.3, which agrees uh, much better with the GWPT value. And also I would like to mention a recent uh, experiment that they, for the first time using Atlas to they found an isotropic superconducting gap in this material. So if you take the different part on the Fermi surface, you see that the gap is pretty much uniform. So this is a strong indication that uh, this material is an S-wave uh, uh, superconductor and phonon typically gives us S-wave coupling uh, uh, copper pairing. 
And uh, again, using Macmillan Allendine's formula to estimate TC, um, we get the following plot. So this is a superconducting TC as a function of whole doping X. Um, with DFPT, we get very small values. These symbols are experiment, they are very off. Uh, but with the GWPT, we get pretty good uh, agreement, both in magnitude as well as in trend. So this results taken together told us that the many electron correlation effects greatly enhance the formal mediated TC in this BKDO material. And another quick example is uh, 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 the photo emission kink in culprits. So copper oxide superconductors or culprits are uh, a very uh, important class of materials. And one of its, its feature when people are doing ARPAs is to see that there's a, 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 a kink around 70 MeV binding energy, uh, very ubiquitously in pretty much all culprits at all uh, doping level with some uh, different modifications. So here we use GWPT to compute the spectral function. So this is uh, uh, actually using uh, uh, Berkeley GW plus CPW. Uh, that, that's why we can have a very sharp resolution uh, in the spectral function because the, the matrix elements need to be interpolated to a very fine, extremely fine phonoline uh, and electron grid, KMQ grid. So this is the, the spectral function uh, that we get and we uh, see a very uh, uh, obvious kink feature at the similar binding energy. And if we further extract the dispersion from the spectral function, we see a good agreement between GWPT, which is a red curve uh, uh, with the experiment. Whereas again, we, we have seen that the DFPT kink actually fails in, in this uh, uh, case. This is because also uh, the importance of correlation effects. So uh, for the rest of my talk, um, maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes, I would like to um, go over uh, one of our recent application of this whole workflow in uh, uh, infinite layer nickelate, which is also a recently discovered superconductor. Um, so this example is to show that uh, 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 the importance of both uh, electron phonon matrix elements at the GW level, also GW band structure, and also the importance uh, and the usefulness of having uh, uh, EPW binarization interpolation as well as the Lashberg uh, 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 equation solvers and so on. So, um, so nickelates in general uh, are very interesting. And one of the reasons is that one particular type of nickelates are thought of as being the analogs of unconventional high TC culprits. Um, so this has been perceived for a few decades, but was uh, not achieved until uh, uh, the 2019 that the infinite layer uh, 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 nickelate uh, growing on the substrate of STO in the form of thin film, uh, the uh, Harvard Huang group at Stanford discovered they are superconducting. So this is very uh, uh, interesting and encouraging. Um, so. Uh, after some further development, now people can uh, reach a phase diagram like uh, 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 somewhat similar to Kilprits. And this is a vertical axis is temperature, horizontal axis is the whole doping. And uh, the red curve is the latest uh, 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 superconducting dome. And we see uh, a large doping range as well as uh, the highest TC is around 20 Kelvin. So um, because of this material, uh, uh, Partially because uh, that people were trying to look for the analogs of culprit. So when it was dis uh, discovered as a superconductor, people would naturally think, okay, it, maybe it's unconventional. And uh, uh, this thought has been also further uh, kind of supported by DFT calculations. If you do a direct DFT calculation, you get a lambda of 0.2. That corresponds to a TC of zero Kelvin. Uh, and this is the band structure of this material. So unlike cuprate, whereas supposedly there should be only one uh, band cross Fermi energy for this uh, isostructure, there are two bands in nickelates cross the Fermi energy. So this is a, one of the uh, major difference in this material. So here we use the workflow and uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to compute, to see if we can gain some insights in this material. So let's talk about the GW part first. Uh, this is uh, uh, for the uh, 
a whole dot sample and we computed its DFT band structure uh, uh, at the uh, GGA level. Uh, and uh, this is a GW band structure. They are both interpolated using banner functions. So here we can see that the uh, maximally localized vanier bases near the Fermi surface, uh, there are mainly three uh, characters. Uh, so we project them onto the two bands and you can see that uh, there are three colors. So one is this uh, transition metal nickel dx square minus y square state, and that is in the blue color. And that's the state that, that pretty much looks like cuprid. And there are, there's another band which can be decomposed to two components. One is the rare earth neodymium DZ square orbital, which is in orange, and the other is the interstitial orbital, which is in green. And we see that by just doing a GW calculation, the band structure changes a lot. Uh, especially, uh, we can see that uh, this orange band, which is the rare earth related band, has been pulled down to uh, the Fermi energy significantly. So, uh, this is actually uh, later we find that this is not uh, uh, not unique in, uh, in in the GW calculation. Uh, even at DFT level, uh, or as they uh, slightly beyond DFT level, you do a different or more advanced functional, such as uh, hybrid functional or meta GGA, you would see a similar trend that this uh, uh, rare earth band would gain a stronger presence. At the Fermi surface, uh, rather than in a, a vanilla DFT or vanilla low, uh, LDA level of approximation, and this is also seen in the GW plus DMFT calculation uh, as reported in the literature. So uh, we think that uh, this shows that uh, the correlation effects are indeed important in this class of material. So let's look at uh, its impact uh, from the change of the electronic structure. So. Uh, First thing is that it changes the Fermi surface significantly. So uh, in DFT, we pretty much, we can focus on the denser states uh, for a moment. In DFT part, pretty much the transition metal states are dominant at the Fermi energy. Whereas in the GW calculation, we see the growth of other two components significantly contributing to states on the Fermi level. So you can see this uh, large neodymium Fermi pocket, as well as this large uh, uh, interstitial orbital Fermi surfaces. So that changes the uh, uh, electronic structure near the Fermi surface significantly. And the states near the Fermi energy are pretty critical to superconductivity properly. Uh, and now we can compute the uh, similar as we show in the diamond uh, example, we compute the Elashberg function uh, at both GW and DFP, uh, DFT level. So this contains effects in both the energies and also in electron hormone matrix element. And we see a very large enhancement, pretty much uh, uh, overall frequency. And the integrated lambda at the GW level is 0.7, much larger than the value at the DFT level, 0.13. And we have, this enhancement contains a factor of 5.5. Uh, so this is a really huge enhancement effect. And we can further break down the contribution from this factor of 5.5. Um, so there are two major GW self energy effects. One in the band energy change, uh, which gives the band shifts. The other is the renormalization in matrix elements. And we find that uh, uh, the band character change uh, near the Fermi energy gives a factor of 3.7. And also, this is from GW calculation. And also from GWPT calculation, we find a further enhancement of a factor of 1.5 uh, coming from the electron phono matrix elements effect. So taken together, we have seen a, a, a 5.5 fold uh, enhancement in the electron phono coupling uh, uh, strength at the Fermi surface. So uh, now uh, we uh, combine our workflow, uh, as I mentioned, using Berkeley GW and PW. We can solve the uh, fully multiband anisotropic Elashberg equations uh, using EPW, but fully at the GW level uh, in both uh, energies and metric settings. So we discovered, interestingly, a two gap uh, superconductor like uh, uh, magnesium diboride, people discuss a lot in the literature. So this is the distribution of the gap 
uh, on the Fermi surface, and we see that they are quite anisotropic, which means that they are uh, very Fermi surface dependent. And the large gap are mostly distributed on the neodymium and interstitial orbital bands, uh, whereas for the nickel Fermi surface, they only contain a smaller size of the uh, gap. So we have actually discovered a, a very distinctive bimodal distribution. Uh, and also, uh, we have uh, seen that at least within the C electron phonon mechanism, the neodymium IO uh, interstitial orbital character is dominant, not the uh, uh, nickel states. And uh, we can further go a little bit into details of, of where this bimodal distribution are coming from. So we can decompose the uh, 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 the uh, pair uh, the state pair uh, resolved coupling to different transitions, as well as this lambda nk to different states, and we see very distinct behavior. For the nickel nickel transition, we see uh, the coupling uh, strengths are mostly small and narrowly distributed within the small region, and for the neodymium IO neodymium IO transitions they contain a very large range of coupling, and the average is around 1.8. And for the uh, interband coupling, there is an asymmetric uh, distribution. So given this uh, uh, behavior, we would lead to a bimodal distribution in the uh, band resolved or state resolved uh, uh, electron phonon coupling. And that leads to the two gap superconductivity we have seen in the last slide. So, uh, uh, so then we can compute the gap, uh, solve the Asperger equation at different temperature, we get the gap as a function of T and we can extract this TC uh, with mu star 0.05, which TC is around uh, 22 Kelvin. And I would like to emphasize that the TC dependence is not heavily uh, relying on mu star because the lambda here, especially because of the two band, uh, uh, two, the lambda around one uh, is so the um, mu star is uh, so we can also compute the quasi superconducting quasi particle uh, density of states then we see clearly see a two gap feature and this actually uh, uh, agrees with uh, uh, existing uh, tunneling data which they discovered both a full gap behavior as well as a v-shaped gap behavior so uh, in order to explain the distinction here, we just introduced an external or uh, 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 yeah, external broadening parameter to smear out our dense of states uh, coming from intrinsic calculation, extrinsic. Uh, uh, we, we introduced an extrinsic broadening parameter. So we see that when the broadening is small, we actually get a pretty clear full gap feature agreeing with the experimental full gap. And when we include the uh, smearing, which would represent some scattering in material, we will, uh, uh, we will get a pretty good agreement with the V-shape uh, observation. So um, one thing to note that uh, uh, there is a reason for the introduction of this parameter because this sample, uh, the uh, nucleate, the infinite layer nucleate thin film is known to have very bad quality because of the uh, synthesis pro uh, process. So uh, that justifies the introduction of this uh, broadening parameter. Okay, so lastly, uh, we also performed a doping dependent uh, calculation uh, by explicitly computing the GW band structure uh, uh, at the different doping level. Uh, however, we are assuming the electron phonon coupling metric segments at the GW level, but uh, only from the x equals 0.2 because of the uh, heaviness in the calculation. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, this is the uh, 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 we think that the main doping effect is coming from the uh, change in the band structure. So let's take a look what we get. Uh, we find a non-rigid band behavior in the band structure, and that gives us the uh, strong doping dependent uh, superconducting, superconducting TC uh, from calculation. And we see that uh, there is a rapid drop of TC as we increase whole doping, which actually agrees with the experiment. And when uh, uh, the whole doping is uh, smaller, the, uh, the system goes into a charge ordering phase. And let's see what happens. So coming uh, by looking at the band structure at the GW level, we notice that uh, uh, from low whole doping to high dope, whole doping, this neodymium uh, IO band or rare earth band 
uh, responds ra very rapidly to the whole doping. So as you can see from top to the bottom, this band has been pulled away from Fermi energy rapidly. So because uh, if you remember uh, from the electron phono mechanism, it is this band that gives the dominating superconducting uh, behavior. So when this band is moved away from Fermi energy, uh, naturally the TC will go. So uh, uh, given these results, we have uh, uh, shown that the ab initial GW results review and predicted a phono mediated two gap S wave superconductivity in infinite layer nucleates. Uh, and this is to show mainly uh, for the school that uh, uh, by combining different techniques, uh, uh, we can actually now do electron phonon coupling uh, fully at the GW level. And also the interpolation and vanier analysis uh, functions are very helpful. Uh, and the, of course, the anisotropic Lashberg equation solver is also very powerful in order for us to understand phonon mediated uh, superconductivity phenomena. Uh, on another side note that uh, for this nuclear material, since we only discussed the electron phono mechanism, so there could be other uh, unconventional mechanism, uh, uh, but they are uh, not yet explored uh, um, from that. So uh, taken together, uh, uh, I hope to have the, a few take home messages. Uh, so the first is that we developed the GDL perturbation theory for electron phonon coupling, but now we can include correlation effects through computing this uh, D sigma dr contribution in the matrix sediments. And also, uh, in order to do actual electron phonon cou uh, coupling calculation, we developed this workflow that combines Abinet, Berkey GW, and EPW together for GWPT. And uh, uh, lastly, I think through a few examples, uh, uh, we have shown that the self energy effects can largely renormalize electron phonon coupling in some materials. So uh, it could be. Uh, uh, non negligible in, in, in different cases. Okay, so lastly, uh, I would like to thank uh, my uh, advisor, uh, both PhD and uh, uh, postdoc advisor, Professor Stephen Louis, and also many of uh, the collaborators uh, in the last several years involved in the development. And also, I would like to thank the different institutions and uh, resources, funding agencies for the support. Um, and also, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jinglu, for the great talk. Um, so we have quite a few questions. Um, okay. Should I start with the question or you want to do with the, the group picture first? I think we are going to do the group picture later, right? Yes, we finish this lecture, then we move to the Zoom meeting uh, link okay. to the picture. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to just go over the, the question. Um, mm -hmm. So as a first check to estimate the coupling, uh, it is often sufficient to simply integrate the electron phonometric elements on a grid to get the coupling and isotopic Elishenberg function. Um, does Berkeley GW offer this possibility or one must go through EPW? Uh, Berkeley GW does not have the Elishenberg uh, solver. So this is done uh, in the EPW uh, through this workflow. Um, let me go back. So uh, uh, through here that you can compute uh, different properties with the EPW. But EPW in principle can take input from uh, any code. So uh, here we prepare those input at the GW level. So perfect slide for the next question. Uh, is this practical workflow combining GW, Abinit and EPW be available for the general users? Uh, it will be available. It's still in the development stage. So we'll release it in the future. Okay, so are the Coulomb effects wrapped uh, into the G, um, GW matrix elements that were uh, assumed to be uh, accounted for by the Coulomb pot pseudo potential? Uh, in other words, might be there some overlap with these effects? Uh, no, uh, there's no overlap because uh, these Coulomb effects is included in the G itself, it has nothing to do with uh, electron electron repulsion. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different it's, it's a different term. All right. Um, so from the formalism, it looks like the many extra bands are not needed for the DFPT part since there's, there's, these are not uh, directly mixed with the GW correction. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. And actually, uh, that's a very good observation. Uh, uh, 
for example, so we don't have to compute the full matrix, full matrix within GW because it's very expensive. Um, for example, for superconductivity, we just need states near uh, the, the for the bands near the Fermi energy. But for kink, it may be a little bit trickier because it involves the thermal states and also other properties. So it really depends on what you need. And for DFPT, for DF, it's also for DFPT, right? So if you do say DFPT calculation for uh, superconductivity in EPW, you can actually select a window that you don't interpolate many that conform to matrix elements. But because at the DFT level, computing the full matrix uh, 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 of G is very cheap because the non-self-consistent calculation you just uh, sandwich the operator is very cheap, but it's not cheap at all at the GW calculation. So uh, in practice, we don't have to compute that many uh, elements as we typically uh, give uh, a DFT. All right. Okay, so does GWPT always increase the electron phonon coupling strength? Uh, in, it seems that uh, Migdal uh, Elishberg theory tends to overestimate superconductivity transition temperature, at least for borrowed manganese. Um, then, how can uh, GWPT give more reasonable superconducting transition temperature than normal DFT method? Okay, so it does not always enhance, as we see, for example, in the case of copper, uh, from our calculation, it actually decreased a little bit, and uh, in indium, it's pretty much the same. Um, so it is indeed system dependent, and this behavior uh, is actually intriguing, and we are still uh, are trying to understand its behavior in different materials. Uh, but uh, from our calculation, we have seen uh, that in the so-called strongly correlated or materials that are oxides, uh, there seem to be a, a consistent enhancement effect. Um, for MGB2, um, it's a good question. Uh, we have not done the calculation yet, but uh, uh, if I remember correctly in the literature, uh, uh, there is some, there are some work, people have used frozen phonon to estimate the GW effects in MGB2 uh, or a similar material, I don't quite remember, and there's not much change. So uh, if that is true, then following the same calculation, we'll be seeing a situation maybe like this here, that the GWPT does not change much. So um, the uh, if we use GW to do electric equation calculation, we pretty much get a reasonable similar results uh, okay. in MGB2. Great. So how do you uh, achieve doping in computation, especially for uh, computationally laborious work such as uh, GWPT? Yeah, so mostly virtual crystal approximation because the calculations are very expensive. So we want to limit the size of the unit cell. So we typically use virtual crystal approximation. All right. Um, so nickel is ferromagnetic. Uh, so the theory can be used for magnetic metals as well? Um, there are two questions. So the theory cannot be used for magnetic materials yet because we haven't included any spin polarization or spinner uh, in our formalism and implementation. And for nickel is a magnet, it's a tricky question. It's a, it's a magnet uh, at the low doping and it's uh, antiferromagnetic without long range order. We have done calculations actually showing that short range uh, antiferromagnetic correlation would pretty much does not affect the states that much if you do a band unfolding and especially for this uh, 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 new linear IO band. So, uh, so, so that's a few common. And, uh, and also as the doping gets uh, increased, uh, the short range order also disappears. So okay. just want to add a few comments. Um, is Abinit going to be the only uh, option for calculating the FT and the FPT part? For GWPT, yes, uh, currently, because the, the because the development stage is really still in the early stage. Um, there are some technical reasons that we uh, chose Abinit uh, over Quan Espresso in the beginning stage of the development. Um, there are some convenience using Abinit, uh, but in principle, uh, there's no limitation, but one just need to do the, the development. All right. So we have just two more questions. Do we have time for these or? Um, okay. We can quickly go over. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you have talked about kinks in the energy versus uh, wave wave vector plot in one of your slides. 
Yeah. Um, as the width of, the, of these kinks increase, we get our results more close to the experimental value. Why these kinks are important? Oh, okay. So that's a very interesting question. So uh, uh, filters were discovered uh, in the 80s and uh, people still till today don't know it's uh, relevant. I mean, it's not relevant. I mean, it's origin or which kind of uh, uh, mechanism could explain it. So Kink was first uh, discovered uh, in late uh, 1990s and early 2000. And uh, it was very exciting at that moment because this is a clear, kind of clear feature of a electron boson coupling. Uh, uh, so that indicates a bosonic mode near the Fermi energy. And that typically, or it's possible to couple to electron and give superconductivity. So that's why people were excited at the moment, trying to understand what's the origin of this mode and if it's related to superconductivity. So that's why people were interested in it. All right, last question. Very interesting talk. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, GW energies plus wave function can be fairly easily imported to EPW code um, used as an input instead of DFT. Is it possible to quickly summarize how GWPT is different, superior to simply import the GW energies and wave function? Uh, can you repeat the last sentence again? So, um, so I guess what's the difference probably in using the EPW and import in um, the GW energy and wave function uh, rather than using, I guess, your uh, GWPT workflow? Um, one just has to implement it, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I don't quite understand what, what, the, uh, what the difference means. Uh, the, the results are different in some materials as I demonstrated. And in terms of uh, uh, workflow, uh, EPW is directly reading quantum espresso wave functions. And to emphasize that we don't change wave functions yet in GW, so we are just taking in uh, energies and metric sediments. Uh, but even that, that involves uh, some uh, uh, modifications in the EPW code uh, to change the, the workflow um, in the first of the course. Right. So, so I guess if Jonah wants to to talk a little bit more, we we will be available uh, <clears throat> later in the tutorial session. So um, mm -hmm. he want to discuss more. Um, he can just ping you after. All right. And with that, we have um, we have finished um, the uh, Q and A session, and this also concludes uh, the morning talks. Mm -hmm. And um, we can just, I guess, uh, log in again to the workshop uh, mm -hmm. Zoom link. And uh, we're going to start uh, in 20 Taking minutes. A, no, no, uh, no, no, we're going to take, take a picture first. Yeah, if, uh, if we're going to take the picture first. Yes, can log in right now on the tutorial okay. link just to take the picture. Thank okay. you. Okay, so everybody, thanks again uh, for the contribution for the contribution by the speakers and for the all engagement by the audience. And we're going to leave this uh, link for now and rejoin to the workshop link, so the tutorial link. All right. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you.